So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's launch of the Reuters Institute for Journalism's annual digital news report. It is, and it's amazing to say, the 10th edition. Uh, I've been involved now, I think, for the last seven years, and I can tell you it's, this, this, this morning discussion will be utterly fascinating. And the report is obviously self-evidently incredibly important and an extremely interesting uh, piece of rolling work. Now, we've only got an hour this morning, so I'm going to dive straight in. Um, practicalities first. I mean, we've got an extraordinary panel coming up uh, in about 15, 20 minutes time. Uh, please send questions now uh, via the Q&A uh, form, and I'll try and get through as many as I can during the discussion. Before that, we've got three speakers. Um, we have the CEO of the Thomson Reuters Foundation. We've got the CEO of the Reuters Institute, and we've got uh, the author, uh, Nick Newman, who is going to take you through the report's findings. So first, I'm going to hand over to Antonio. Antonio, over to you. Thank you, Ed, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you today for the launch of the report. A year ago today at the launch of the 2020 report, we had an initial sense of the speed at which the media landscape was being affected by the COVID pandemic. But a year later, we have a much clearer picture of the extent to which media consumption and independent journalism have been deeply shaped by the global pandemic. COVID has simultaneously driven an acute need for accurate information and a thirst for trusted news. And at the same time, though, it has accelerated threats to the very ecosystem that supplies trusted news. The pandemic has highlighted the extent to which the health and well-being of individual nations are highly dependent on the need for a functioning, free and vibrant media landscape. But with many journalists facing a surge in censorship and many news organizations facing plummeting revenues, the economic sustainability of the media ecosystem is in jeopardy. And as a result, editorial independence is increasingly at risk. And up against this, the proliferation of digital platforms has supercharged the spread of misinformation and disinformation, plunging readers' trust in news to an historic law. According to the latest Edelman Trust Barometer, 59% of consumers in 20 white countries believe journalists are deliberately misleading them. Free and independent media are fighting the battle of their lives, but for some, their defenses are weak. So how can we all play our part and prevent what philanthropic organization Luminate has bleakly defined as a media extinction event? Our roadmap to recovery should be coordinated. It should take learnings from those leading the way in efforts to strengthen the economic sustainability of the media ecosystem post COVID. And that is where the digital news report plays such a critical role. This is an invaluable resource, not just for those interested in news consumption and revenue trends, but for all of us committed to protecting and promoting free, accurate and impartial journalism, because the link between sustainability and independence is one that we need to remain strongly aware of. At the Thomson Reuters Foundation, we use the combined power of journalism and the law to defend and promote media freedom, a crucial pillar of any free, fair and informed society. And we are, of course, extremely proud to found the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. By continuing to drive conversations about the future of news, we can all play our part in strengthening and protecting the future of journalism. It has never been more critical to do so. And now I hand it over to Rasmus Nielsen, the director of the Reuters Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, and welcome everyone to the launch of the 2021 Reuters Institute Digital News Report. My name is Rasmus Nelson. I'm director of the Institute, uh, one of the co-authors of the report and professor of political communication at the University of Oxford. Our mission at the Institute is to explore the future of journalism worldwide through debate, engagement and research, and to connect practice and research to help journalists and editors build better and more sustainable journalism for tomorrow. Digital News Report is key to that. This is our 10th digital news report covering 46 markets, including India, Indonesia, Thailand, Nigeria, Colombia, and Peru for the first time in the report. And this is a milestone for us in that 46 markets that represent, uh, account for more than half of the world's population. And we are very, very proud of this significant step towards a more truly global report. A reminder here of the methodology. The survey is based on an online poll, and as such, it will tend to underrepresent traditional news behavior such as television, print, and radio when we talk about cross-platform behavior. 
And with a more diverse set of countries covered in the report with different levels of internet penetration, we've tried to do a bit more comparison between more similar markets, such as within Europe, Latin America, or Asia. Polling was conducted on our behalf by YouGov in January and early February 2021 with samples of around 2,000 in each market. And of course, a lot has happened since, uh, including politically. In Hong Kong, Apple Daily has had to suspend operations in face of full court pressure. And in Nigeria, the government has banned Twitter in just one example of how authorities are often stepping in to try to seize greater control uh, over the flow of information in our societies. The Institute is supported by the Thomson Reuters Foundation, and the Digital News Report is supported by 14 different organizations, including Google News Initiative, BBC, media regulators, industry organizations, and a number of foundations and academic institutions around the world. We're very grateful for their support making this work possible. Today, we will hear more about what the report has to tell us about trust in news, fear of misinformation, the business of news, and much more, followed by a discussion with a suite of outstanding top editors and news media executives from across Europe. But first, I'll hand it over to the lead author of the report, Nick Newman, to present the key findings. Thanks, Erasmus. Uh, so this survey was conducted at a time when the impact of coronavirus varied quite considerably across countries. But if we look at the position in Europe, uh, where things were relatively uh, similar in January, we can see some, uh, some really interesting patterns. So firstly, uh, television news uh, has managed to retain at least part of that initial surge uh, in terms of significant upticks you can see here in many European countries especially those with sort of well-trusted uh, public broadcasters and commercial broadcasters. Of course, it remains to be seen if this is a sort of blip related to lockdown, or uh, clearly you can see there the longer term trends there are moving in the opposite directions. Uh, our focus group interviews confirm that sort of initial push towards broadcast, but as the story's gone on, uh, the sort of bleak nature of the news is leading uh, to some uh, news fatigue at least, uh, and we're also seeing that online after that initial surge, uh, things are coming back to normal levels of usage. In sharp contrast to TV news, this next chart shows how COVID has negatively affected print in terms of weekly use uh, because of many of the difficulties of distribution and access. And we can see these very significant falls, uh, not just in Europe, but actually in almost every country in our survey. And the acceleration, of course, is making the financial position for many legacy media companies much more difficult. If we look at online usage, uh, the change is a bit mixed. So some brands up, some brands down. But this chart represents, you know, some some good news in that we see trusted news brands doing disproportionately better. So each of these dots represents a specific news brand across 14 European countries and those with higher trust levels on the right hand side of the chart also have higher consumption online compared with with last year. And I've just marked a few of these brands sort of public service brands, uh, brands with a reputation for reliable news like VG in Norway, Irish Times, Azerbator in, in, in Portugal, for example. More generally, uh, we find that the percentage across our whole sample of more than 40 countries that say they trust most news most of the time is up uh, by six percentage points, reversing to some extent uh, the decline that we've seen in recent years. So this may be the fact that sort of evidence-based coverage of COVID has made the news feel more straightforward to people. Uh, COVID certainly squeezed out some of the partisan politics that undermine trust, uh, in, uh, at least in some countries. Trust in distributed environments like search and social media remain significantly lower than overall trust. And we also see that the trust gap has grown uh, between uh, the news in general and those distributed environments, again, suggesting this flight to more reliable information. Looking at specific countries, we can see that uh, trust across a range of, of European countries, um, you can see big differences. So Finland at the top there, more than two thirds say they trust the news most of the time. Compare that with the UK, uh, just over a third. And although uh, that's up eight percentage points this year, that's still much lower than before uh, the Brexit referendum. Uh, at the bottom there, you've got the United States, uh, which has the least trust in our survey, just 29%, reflecting, I think, sort of deep divisions 
over politics, obviously, but also over race this year, uh, with the media often seen as the cheerleader on one side or the other. And all of this, of course, against a backdrop of concern, increasing concern about false and misleading information. We find that much of this now relates to COVID-19, uh, in fact, as much as relates to politics or other subjects. Over half now say they have seen some kind of false or misleading information about COVID in the last week, for example. And um, when we ask, you know, who are you most concerned about when it comes to false or misleading information about coronavirus, it is actually domestic politicians uh, that are mentioned first, followed by ordinary people uh, and activists like uh, um, anti-vaxxers, for example. Um, but people also, a minority also feel that journalists are, are responsible in some way for misinformation. Concern about politicians is higher in countries like Brazil, where President Bolsonaro, of course, himself has made hundreds of false claims over the last year and, and less in many parts of Europe. So one of the, the big questions for the panel is, you know, whether concerns about misinformation and this sort of move back to more reliable news has increased people's willingness to pay for online news. And uh, we do pick up a bit of this in our data this year. So the proportion taking out a subscription, membership, donation, one-off payment uh, has increased in some countries, 21% now in the US, it was uh, 9% five years ago. Uh, we also see it growing in the Netherlands, in Belgium, Switzerland this year, as well as Nordic countries. And you can see there that 45% are now paying for online news in Norway. Uh, at the same time, in other countries like uh, Spain, France, Germany, and the UK, all represented on this panel, paying for news remains uh, minority activity. And, you know, most people are still reluctant to pay for uh, online news because there's so much free news around from individual news providers, but also from aggregators uh, and social media. And in most countries, we see uh, a sort of winner takes most dynamic persisting. So a few big national brands accounting for around half of all subscribers in each market. So New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal in the US, Telegraph Times, The Guardian in the UK, accounting for 52% of all subscribers. Um, but in Norway, uh, one, of the, um, one of the things we've done this year is look at the extent to which people are prepared to pay for local uh, publications online. Um, we find here some really interesting and significant differences across countries. So in Norway, 57% of uh, subscribers say they are paying for a local publication online, compared with just 3% in the UK and 23% in the United States. Uh, and in Norway and the United States, we find more people taking out two publications, often a national and a local publication too. So this year, we've tried to understand in a bit more detail um, how issues like gender and politics and race and age are playing into perceptions of the news media by asking how fair different groups feel coverage in the news media is to them. Uh, and this chart illustrates how politics is such a huge driver of perceptions, especially in the US, where people who self-identify on the right here, uh, that's the, the, the blue with a net negative score of 59 points compared with people on the left who have a positive uh, view of, of the news coverage, uh, plus 17 people on the left. Uh, you can see that people on the right in Spain, also in Germany, feel the media is a bit loaded against them. Interestingly, the story in the UK is a little bit different. So people on the left are uh, more likely to say that media coverage is unfair. So a net negative score of, of, of eight. We also find that gender is a bit of a fault line. So women, uh, especially young women, feeling that news coverage is a little bit less fair. And then differences in terms of where you live. So huge gap here in uh, perception uh, between people who live, say, in the northeast of England and London and the southeast, where people uh, are more likely to say that news media is, is fair in its coverage. Uh, and we see lower fairness scores in parts of eastern Germany, uh, also in uh, many of the southern states in the US. And also in the US, um, we can look at the sort of issue of race where people from black and Hispanic backgrounds 
are also more likely to feel media coverage is unfair to them. People uh, from a white background feel that the media coverage is broadly uh, fair. Another big debate at the moment is whether in these more divided times, journalists should still try to be impartial or objective in their news coverage. And uh, we've just seen the launch here in the UK of a new TV station, GB News, that says it's going to try and counter the metropolitan or liberal bias of of existing uh, broadcasters such as the BBC. And of course, in the US, we have uh, um, Fox and CNN taking more partisan positions. So this year, we've looked at this issue in more detail, both in the survey, but also in focus groups uh, in a number of countries. And across countries, we find incredibly clear support for this sort of ideal of impartial or objective news, where news outlets lay out the facts, reflect a range of views, and let people make up their own minds rather than argue a particular point of view. And we find this is broadly true across ages. Uh, And in focus groups, we find people saying, particularly with COVID and particularly with politics, contentious political and social issues, they just want the facts. We do get a slightly different story, though, when we ask whether news outlets should try and be neutral on every issue. So there's an acceptance, for example, on an issue like domestic violence, that there's not necessarily two sides to that story or, or racism or climate change. You know, some people feel that that journalists and news organizations should take more of a stand on these issues. And it's interesting that under 35s are more likely to want journalists to take take a position on on some of these issues. And then just finally, uh, turning to the issue of engaging young people with news. And this, I think, is of concern to you know many of those on the panel today and the role of social platforms, the changing role of social platforms. This has been one of the key themes in the 10 years we've been doing this report is the sort of different behavior of younger groups Uh, and and this chart really looks at under 35s in terms of how they prefer to access news on the internet across this is across all countries and you can see broadly how they much they prefer the convenience of social media or search uh, rather than going you know directly to a news website or an app so building that direct relationship with younger people is just that much harder. And then we document in terms of the networks they're using for news uh, that people, uh, younger people are using more YouTube, they're using more Instagram, Snapchat. And now this year we're seeing TikTok really sort of come into its own uh, with sort of posts and memes about coronavirus, uh, mental health, Black Lives Matter, for example. Uh, across our entire sample, Uh, We find TikTok is now used by almost uh, a third of 18 to 24s for any purpose. Around one in 10 say they've used TikTok for news in the last year. And in some countries like Peru, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, TikTok, Instagram uh, have been at the heart of sort of political protest movements this year, uh, in many cases driven by by younger people. And news organizations have been starting to sort of experiment with how to tell stories in this these new environments often using humor and music Um, there's an example on the right here from the bbc's sophia smith gala singing a sea shanty about that that ship that got stuck in the in the suez canal this year we've also been looking in a bit more detail about where people are paying most attention when they're in those social networks like TikTok and Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. You know, are they paying attention to journalists or is it politicians or, or celebrities or influencers? Uh, now, this chart essentially, uh, this is averages across country, uh, but it tells a really interesting story. So mainstream media journalists do play a really significant role in, in Twitter, that's the dark blue line, and also Facebook when it comes to news. But look at Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok on the right. <clears throat> it's much more about celebrities, uh, you know, actors, musicians, social media influencers, and also ordinary people, even, you know, when it comes to news topics. Uh, that change may be, um, uh, it, it may change uh, if news becomes a bigger part of these platforms, but it does, you know, make the culture different. And it's much more challenging, I think, for mainstream media to reach younger people there. So finally, just a a few questions emerging from this year's research uh, for the panel. So COVID-19 has accelerated that digital change, as we've heard, putting pressure, further pressure on traditional models. Uh, And uh, I guess the question there is, you know, are publishers moving fast enough? Secondly, um, how can the media 
build on the trust that has been gained during the pandemic? Can pay models go go much further? Uh, and uh, what about those findings on fairness and unfairness? What does that mean for greater diversity and inclusion in, in newsrooms? And then finally, how to engage those younger audiences that find social media and new mobile formats so enticing. So hopefully some data to uh, give you food for thought and I'll hand over now to Ed and the panel. Thanks very much. Nick, thank you very much. Fascinating as always. So look, straight to the panel, let me uh, tee them up. So we have Rula Kalaf, the uh, editor of the FT, who you all know has had an absolutely distinguished career in journalism, particularly in uh, foreign, foreign affairs. Before taking on the editor role, she was deputy editor, overseeing uh, a range of newsroom initiatives and uh, award-winning editorial projects, as well as a global network of over 100 foreign correspondents. Uh, to her right is Naya Nilsson, uh, a digital director at the BBC. She's not only a journalist, but um, has also led some pretty large scale digital transformations of newsrooms and news infrastructures. Uh, she oversees BBC News Digital and social strategy, as well as editorial output and product development across BBC News websites, across the apps, social accounts and third party platforms, a mega, mega job. Um, underneath um, Rula, we've got uh, Rosalia Yoret, who is the CEO of LDRIO.S, uh, the leading uh, native digital news site in Spain. She's over two decades of experience in digital media. She's a member of the board and responsible for digital strategy of the two leading legacy publishers in Spain, El Mundo and El Paz. Um, and then to her right, we've got Alexandra uh, Fogel Schmidt, who is the deputy editor in chief of Suddeutsche Zeitung, and was until recently actually a correspondent uh, covering Israel and the uh, Palestinian territories. Um, SZ is the, as you know, the, the Germany's largest daily broadsheet. And before working at SZ, she was editor in chief for 10 years and later co editor of the Austrian daily newspaper Der Standard and the news portal Der Standard. AT. So an amazing uh, panel this morning. And I think, as you heard from Nick, a kind of mixed picture in that, you know, tr trust in media is up, yet more than half of people say actually they're not terribly interested in news, about 53 percent. Subscriptions increasing, uh, accelerated by COVID, yet predominantly with educated, um, uh, uh, older audiences with young women and minority um, ethnic groups feeling underrepresented. Um, impartiality and independent news winning out over partisan reporting. However, the next generation of subscribers feeling that actually when it comes to issues like social justice and climate, media needs to be more kind of activist. So some incredibly interesting discussions. I want to um, point this one. I want to start first with the impact of COVID and maybe go first to Alexandra to get the view from Germany. I mean, the, the report this morning talks about COVID essentially kind of hammering a final nail in the coffin of the print news industry. Do you see it that way? Is that the picture in Germany? No, because, well, uh, I think the good news is that trust is up. And uh, in Germany, we saw in recent months, uh, uh, on the other hand, also attacks on journalists, uh, which uh, journalists who covered uh, big demonstrations which were going on uh, in the country. And, uh, well, um, this was a backslash, but on the other hand, uh, in our uh, media company, we saw uh, a rise in digital subscriptions, uh, which was good for us. Um, we Our figures doubled in that terms. And in our case, it was possible also to compensate the cut on, on the ad side and also on the circulation side. And what is different in the German speaking world compared to the rest, at least of Europe, is that still um, readers are used to the print edition and uh, there are still high levels of circulations. And now 
we saw a dramatic shift, an increase in um, in um, yeah, uh, digital uh, subscription. Uh, but now we are faced with the challenge to hold these new subscribers and especially the young ones. Mm. So I think that's the main challenge for the next few months. But it's good for us to see that the trust um, in um, normal media is back, at least uh, in a German speaking world. I, I want to come back to that point about how you retain the new subscribers that um, you, you've all won over the last year, because that's obviously quite notable. But how do you how do you avoid the kind of spin down and the churn out? Before that, can I speak to this question about whether COVID has actually brought forward the sort of the, 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 the final day in which newspapers are actually printed and sold at kind of newsstands? Um, Rula, you, 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 you print uh, an international uh, newspaper, the Financial Times. Do you think COVID has brought forward that day, the, the, the end of printed newspapers? I think this was uh, the impression that I had at the very beginning of, of the crisis, because we suddenly saw a collapse in advertising and in uh, circulation, because, as you said, it was very difficult to distribute. Mm -hmm. but, but now I look at it very differently, um, because what COVID did was affirm and, in fact, reinforce um, the uh, the notion that the future is in in digital, uh, without, however, completely putting a, or bringing an end uh, to to print. One of the very interesting things that we saw last year was that our weekend print uh, sales went up, uh, which is which is very unusual, and they continue to go up this year and at the, while we saw advertising um, going way down uh, it has stabilized a bit this year so I think a smaller circulation is what you settle on uh, Monday to Friday a bigger circulation and much more growing circulation on on weekends um, and the focus continues to be on the digital uh, transformation. We were lucky in many ways because we started the digital transformation, um, as, as you know, um, ten, about 10 years ago. And so we had uh, our digital subs business was already very solid. And what we see this year is the digital subs business continues to be very strong. Unusually, we see a big jump in digital advertising. Um, and that's been something that we were not expecting. We saw that a bit last year because a lot of uh, advertisers moved uh, to digital. But there is a massive growth in digital advertising this year. That's one of the shifts that I think uh, COVID brought about and that will continue. Um, again, um, in terms of traffic, you know, huge traffic. Brexit used to be our sort of highest uh, uh, traffic numbers, and the curve was uh, completely off the charts during uh, during the COVID crisis. And it coincided also with a, with uh, a U.S. Uh, election, a very troubled U.S. election. The challenge, as we have heard, is to keep many of these um, subscribers because you can see it very clearly as soon as people as soon as lockdowns be, uh, began to ease and people started to go out they had less time on their screen it is what you would expect so you have to constantly think about how to continue to engage your readers this is i think a challenge that we all face and that i think about every day so I think it's a, it's a really good point actually to raise with uh, Rosalia about how do you keep those subscribers that you've uh, attracted, that you've won over the, the last year. But before before you answer that question, I, I was really struck by uh, what Runa was saying about the uh, shift towards weekend reading. It's kind of quite interesting um, uh, what has happened. Are there, are there any significant kind of 
trends or um, things that you saw in changing audience behaviour, changing consumption last year uh, uh, that's, that's notable from your point of view? Sorry, this was a question to me, right? Not to Rory. Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, this is we actually what we saw is a huge growth of the uh, audience, as as Rola was saying. I mean, during the pandemic days, we had a in our case, it was like a hundred percent of growth in the number of unique readers uh, uh, to our pages. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, it was uh, um, especially on the pages related to COVID, uh, we had a, a very strong coverage of fact-checked information with visualization of data, and that was super important. And uh, in our case, it was uh, very, very important as well, The uh, our local coverage. Um, this is one of the differences of uh, El Diario uh, uh, compared to other um, national titles in, in Spain. We have a uh, quite broad local coverage. We have uh, 13 um, regional editions of uh, El Diario. And um, this local coverage was super important in a, in a pandemic, which was uh, global in a way, but very local in the results and in the uh, um, the way it was tackled in every single region. So that was uh, absolutely extraordinary. What we saw as well, which is great, I think we will discuss about that later, is uh, that we saw a growth in the audience from women, uh, and quite important uh, audience uh, uh, growth in the audience of women. We 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 are now actually uh, um, we have an audience of 51% uh, of women readers. Uh, they have surpassed men, while before the COVID it was the other way around. So. Um, that was quite interesting as well, and, we, and the audiences got a bit younger as well, which is another good uh, uh, piece of news. Um, regarding the post-COVID area, uh, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, this is we, with this increase of uh, of the audiences, uh, I, I'm, I said it was a hundred percent increase. We also had a um, almost a sixty percent increase in the number of. Subscribers, in our case, is members. We have paying members. It is a very similar model to The Guardian in the UK. And uh, as you can imagine, it is uh, it's quite an issue to go through all the renewals this year. We've been through this, uh, this uh, bunch of renewals, thousands of renewals over the last uh, weeks and months, and uh, we're still uh, going through that. So it's, uh, for us, very important to maintain the engagement. We decided to... Um, for this reason, we decided to implement uh, a meter in our pages that uh, is uh, sort of detecting our most loyal users, uh, the, the, the ones that read up to 10 articles, and we push them a, a little bit harder to become members. But because we have this, uh, our main purpose from the very beginning was to allow all readers, regardless of their income, to uh, to uh, be able to read our contents, we uh, let the, the user choose the price they want to pay. And it can be zero if they uh, allege um, um, a difficult economic situation. And, uh, and they don't have to prove that. I mean, this is not, it is just the word. And uh, and the we are managing to, to go through this, this uh, a uh, huge uh, mountain of renewals and we uh, we want to be able to go to get to the end of the year with uh, um, a little bit of growth so uh, still working on that so, so re renewal is not really an issue for um, our colleague Naya uh, on, on, on the panel but of course there are other metrics that are critical for public service media um, now we've heard actually quite a lot of optimism from the panel um, about what you know the, the impact of COVID over over the last year. What kind of changed with um, your users? Uh, yeah, first of all, even for BBC News and other public service broadcasters, let's not forget that there is also a business model there. We are only here if uh, you know the the democracies keep uh, wanting to invest in them, and that is why it is really important for us that we measure whether people are actually using what we do. And we've seen, you know, similar to, to my colleagues, I must say, um, I don't know about you guys, but I've had some years before the pandemic where people would ask me questions like, uh, is journalism even important anymore? Who wants news? You know, it's kind of a, a dying business. 
And I, I'm not getting that question after the year of the pandemic. You know, I think we have demonstrated as a as a craft just how important journalism is not only for democracy and free speech, but for us to know about what is going on. I mean, the reason why we know why things are happening, why we know, I mean, we might be a bit confused, but we broadly know whether we are getting vaccinated or what other countries are doing, is due to journalism. And I, I think we kind of collectively should take a bit of a pride in, I think we've risen to the challenge, if I'm honest. And I'm, I see it across the board and I'm so impressed by what, what uh, you know, other media like the ones represented in this panel has done, and also what the teams at the, at, at the BBC has done. Because I think, I think what we've done is maybe move a little bit away of just looking at what do people read, you know, what do they click on, can it, can it convert into a subscription, to also thinking about what value do we actually give to people. And if you, you look at our numbers, unsurprisingly, we have grown a lot, uh, not least digitally, the past year. So in the UK, we've grown from reaching or uh, being used by 30% of the population every week to nearly 40% of the population. I mean, that is some growth, right? And domestic, er, globally, we, we have grown with several hundred percent into reaching around half a billion people uh, a, a week. And what we can see is especially around big events like the US election, or big developments in the COVID pandemic, we've seen not least young and, and non-traditional news users coming to us. And what has been really pleasing as a journalist is that the things people have sought out is really important stuff. You know, it is it's scientific stuff based, based on science. It is explanation. Are uh, one of the most, uh, they're, they're kind of two, the two biggest hits of our coverage have been our continuous live coverage of the pandemic. We have now had our live page on for more than a year, covering around the world, around the clock. Uh, we've kind of, you know, realized that digital is always on, always live, with a mixture of updates and, and expert analysis and, and expertise. And then, then kind of quite digital things like our lookup service, where in the UK you can put in your postcode and then you can see how many confirmed cases there are in your specific area, where, where we've now seen <laughs> actually half a billion uh, visits to that service in 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 the UK. And, and I'm not only saying this because I'm extremely proud of what we've done. I think there are some clues to this that, that maybe what digital can offer is also stuff that is not only kind of a traditional story, but our services where we kind of find the most important essence for, for people. And then we use our, uh, smart or algorithms and stuff to make sure that you get the information that is really useful for you. So I'll, I'll stop I'll stop talking about that, but I, but I think it has been really interesting to see how the traffic has centered around live and explanation based on expertise. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I think it's super interesting to, to see now, right, the, the, the importance of public information and the, and the role the media has in communicating public information cleanly and fairly and impartial, uh, impartially during, during a pandemic. That's very clear in the report, as is the, the, the swing back partly to TV, understandably, when everybody is locked at home and waiting for the next kind of press conference. Um, can I talk about the, um, the this issue around the risk of having essentially a two-tier system in the world where you have um, people who have education, who have money, who have interest in politics and business, who are subscribing, and then everyone else not? I was very struck by the fact that, as I think I said in my opening remark, 53% of people just don't give a damn about news. Um, how concerned are you all about that fact and how do you get that group of people engaged in news and journalism? Um, can I come to Rula first on that question? I think this is an important question and one that I definitely um, think about and I'm sure all of us think about. Um, whether we are moving into a world where you have a few dominant news organisations that uh, are trusted by most, but and perhaps 
uh, uh, others are a bit suspicious because of uh, because of the power of these uh, of these organizations, um, and then a lot of uh, a lot of people unable to afford uh, a subscription. I think one good uh, development, and that was pointed out in the report, is that people are taking more than one subscription. So that's already uh, a uh, a positive uh, development, and I think that. If you if we we do move into a world where very much like video streaming, uh, you get subscriptions to several services, I think that then you're you know you're you're getting a broader uh, range of uh, of views, and that is important. I think where it becomes quite uh, difficult is in reaching younger audiences and people who may not want to be paying as much for the news. And I think there we, we have to go to them. Um, they will not just come to us, we have to go to them. Um, and when I say go to them, I mean that we have, for example, a schools uh, program and we do offer the FT uh, for free to thousands of, of schools. We have at least you know, 30,000 students who read the FT for free because we make these deals with schools. Um, then you want, we, we have similar uh, programs at universities. So you need to go to them and you need to explain the FT to them and you need to sort of hook them, make them, make them understand the value of this product, which they can then subscribe to when they can afford it. Um, another, another really, I think, important uh, development is uh, we are thinking and this is still very much in the early stages about whether we should have uh, a, a select app so a taste of, of the FT um, that can go to a lot more people um, and and I think that's something that we you know we're experimenting with we're thinking about it I don't know if it's going to work uh, but I think it is worth experimenting um, with. Uh, and finally, what I would say is, you know, we have to be present on social media. I know that a lot of journalists, including at the FT, say, well, why do we have such a big audience engagement uh, department? Well, we have to be out there. Uh, we have to make uh, what we do known. We also now have many younger journalists who are stars, and that helps. I mean, one of one of the most well-known FT journalists is a data journalist, John Byrne, John Byrne uh, Murdoch. Uh, data journalism is a way of reaching younger audiences and audiences that may not feel that they can be included in um, in the FT ecosystem. Video, be, having cool, edgy video, um, I think, is also very important. Podcasts in the U.S. market, for example, you're not going to really reach Americans un unless you reach them with podcasts. And whether it's video or podcasts, these are free products. Uh, these are not products that you that you need to have a subscription for. So there are different ways, but we have to, you know, we have to have a strategy, and we have to be thinking about this every single day. Yeah, really, you remind me of a conversation I had with uh, Mark Thompson earlier in the year on this topic about how do you attract more millennial uh, readers to newspapers? And he said it's really complicated. You hire more millennial reporters. <laughs> um, I, 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 no, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point. Uh, but it's also related to the diversity point that the report raises. I think that you're not going to be accepted unless you have a more diverse uh, workforce. And, and I think that, you know, the, the reform here really starts at home. Can I, can I pick this point up with Alexandra and um, uh, with, with, with Süddeutsche Zeitung, how are you thinking about the kind of diversity point in the, in the newsroom and that as a lever and a vehicle for getting younger people engaged with news content? Thinking particularly, of course, you've got an election later this year. 
diversity was uh, really a big uh, issue in in German you know, media company the last few months. Uh, and we all are discussing about um, different aspects, not only gender related uh, aspects and issues. And I think, uh, well, we in, in Germany, we have also the special situation uh, dealing with West and Eastern German topics. And there is really uh, a gap between uh, still uh, 30 years after the reunification between these two parts of the country. And uh, for us, it's also important to concentrate more our reporting on the eastern side of the country, which feels a little bit, and Nick mentioned it, neglected uh, in terms of media coverage. So uh, this is a very special German aspect. But I think uh, for, for younger readers, it's getting more and more important to talk about gender related issues. And um, uh, German is a, a language where you have to make a difference between the male and the female form. So we also have um, to think about it, uh, if we, which terms and phrases we use. And we, uh, as Süddeutsche Zeitung, we have a, a special platform just online uh, for our young readers, it's uh, it, it has a special domain, jetzt.de, not so under the umbrella of Süddeutsche Zeitung, with young editors, and they do a lot of stories about, well, uh, dealing with sex issues, for instance, which would not be uh, in the part, uh, in, in the print edition, in, in this form, but I think it's it's important to to deal also with um, topics which are more uh, interesting for young readers. And on the other hand, I think we all have to learn to um, be more engaged with our readers. Um, it's not uh, a one-way uh, channel of uh, communication because so I think we also as editors we have to, to answer questions. Uh, we, we have online discussions with our readers. Um, and I think this is also uh, an important um, step uh, to, to get uh, these readers more involved in our ecosystem and to keep them as, as readers and subscribers. And Rula mentioned many different ways um, we are also thinking and, and trying to attract these leaders and to keep to keep these readers. I think that's important. Can I, can I switch gears and, and talk about the kind of bigger picture, the sustainability of, uh, of the news industry itself and the, the, the role that perhaps government can have in supporting news media and of course the uh platforms as uh, as well and I, and I should say actually uh, um pre previous years we have had contributions from um some of the platforms from google and facebook and i'm i'm pleased actually that we've got um john uh severinson uh from facebook um and we've also got uh, uh, a regular contributor actually Mada from uh google as well with us i'm going to bring them in in a, in a second conscious also of time. Um, Rosalia, can I go to you first? Do you think the government should have any, any government should have anything to do with media in terms of subsidies or supporting? What's your view? Uh, I don't think it's a good idea indeed. Um, I think there is a danger of um, having direct subsidies from the government unless they are super um, established in the legislation so they can not be changed at all by any government and it is it is always a risk as, as the BBC is, is suffering almost every year so I think it is better for the media to uh, to um, to to maintain this uh, complete independency from uh, from the government I think I mean this is of course it is important to to uh, um, find ways to uh, um, make for example, advertising in media by the government and institutions in general, very transparent and objective. That is important. But direct subsidies, I think, is not a good idea because it would um, endanger, in a way, this uh, 
independency because one of the main tasks of the media, of course, is to control government. And uh, can I just ask the same question of other panelists? Does any, do, do any of you have a different view to uh, uh, Rosalia on that point? As an Austrian, I have to admit that um, Austrian media really rely on uh, public support. Nick knows that because there is a, a very uh, a model which uh, with a very strong uh, state support of, of the media organization directly. But I think it's dangerous uh, because, uh, well, uh, there are the, there because there are two two ways of uh, funding uh, media companies in Austria. One is um, relying, uh, well, supporting um, the, the the circulation, and the other way is um, to direct directly ads to uh, media organization which. Uh, well, are more in favor of the government views. And, and this is really dangerous for the independence of media. And in Germany, it's the other way around. Um, and uh, we saw a few months ago, there were plans to support um, from the governmental side, the transformation process. Uh, and to give, there were plans to give um, 220 millions, uh, but uh, well, uh, at the end, um, well, um, the, the government withdraw um, the plans. And I think it's good to to maintain the independence of media. And, and Naya, presumably what you, you would say is that the public media model, which is that actually the BBC is not a state broadcaster, it's not owned by the government, it's owned by the public, is actually a, 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 a an, in, an enduring model and one that still has a lot of logic to it. Yeah, and, and that wouldn't be a surprise uh, coming from me, but I, I would also say I think there's pretty solid research showing that uh, countries that do have editorially independent public service media do also have a big and thriving independent private media industry. So that is maybe my, I, I think, I think more wants more. The more we know, the more curious we get. So I think it is about having as many different uh, types of media as possible in every country. And also all of us accepting and embracing that our, our audiences and customers, they will be using a mix of all of us. And that is completely fine. That is really healthy. I think uh, sometimes it, it becomes a little too black and white where, you know, should should journalism be impartial or should it be opinionated? I would say if I were to found a small digital uh, startup that would kind of cater to a very niche group of wealthy people, it might be a good idea to be opinionated. Maybe that is the best for that business model. And there can be a, uh, information and opinion as well. It is really important for democracies. For the BBC, it is for obvious reason really the wrong thing to do because we are owned by everybody in Britain and we are here to present a, a broad range of views and do our utmost to figure out what are kind of the core facts in any stories. But but I think the things can thrive along each other. And actually, I think sometimes I think it's, it's, it's almost banal, but I don't see this as a cake where we're fighting about kind of which part of the cake. I think we, journalism, we can grow together. And I think we are in competition with everything else people spend their time on, you know. So, so I think rather than competing each other, I think it is actually a good idea for all of us if we were uh, doing our utmost to help each other develop so we become really worth people's time and money when they spend time with us, especially digitally, where the, the, the competition for people's time, of course, is just uh, you know infinite. So I'm going to I'm going to come to John and Mada for some brief comments in a second. But before I do that, Rulo, it was put put the government question to one side. Should the platforms be doing more to support news journalism? I, Love your view on that, and then we'll come to Madef and, and John and get their response. Uh, I think they know they would know my view. Um, I, I don't listen. I don't believe in subsidies either from the from the whether it's from the platforms 
or from, from the government. Um, I think what would be important, and it's something that we have argued, is if you had laws that underpin uh, the value of, of news. Um, and I think when it comes to, to the platform, uh, it may have been a mistake on, on, uh, on the part of the industry because the industry should have come together in a much more um, powerful way to negotiate with, uh, with the platform and to confront uh, the platform. And that is, that is unfortunately not what's happened. Um, the platform have been able to go, you know, to do uh, unilateral uh, deals with, with various uh, publishers. But yes, this is a, you know, it is a um, one of uh, the biggest challenges that I think the media has faced over the last few years. So let, let's let's bring um, Madhav and John in, and I'm going to see if the technology allows. So, oh, it's not going to do six on the screen. It's going to do the two of you. Um, John, let, let's a brief comment, if I if if I may, from you about um, your kind of overall view on this topic and the extent to which you think you have a responsibility. Facebook has a responsibility in respect to um, supporting journalism. Absolutely. First off, thank you for having me and thank you for a, a very in interesting and informative panel so far. I think, you know, this is a very complicated question and topic, obviously, and I think it's important that media outlets have a sustainable business model that does not rely on platforms such as Facebook. And at the same time, people on Facebook did not sign up for a Facebook account to read news. It's a platform for friends and family. So essentially, you know, our core value proposition here is being able to go into an informed conversation with the audience and, and meet new people. But having said that, I think there are so many ways we can help transition to that sustainability. So obviously, you know, build tools to extend paywalls onto Facebook, obviously build products that that help surface more trustworthy and authoritative news. And I think as you have seen, we have started rolling out a product called Facebook News in different countries in which we actually go into uh, agreements with publishers to get even more news on Facebook. So I think, you know, one of our our core opportunities here is getting more trustworthy and high quality news on Facebook while supporting that transition. So I think, you know, it's it's a very fair conversation to have. And I think it's fair to be critical and, and skeptic to to uh, what we're doing. But but I think we're on a good trajectory and a good path. And Madhav, in, in, in respect to Google's view, would you prefer to have a kind of universal solution versus a country by country approach? I mean, what's 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 Google's current view in respect of its role in this space? Well, I think I think we're always going to get down to a country view because we have individual situations with individual countries, with individual laws, um, you know, and it's incredibly diverse. I'm very lucky to have uh, a role that looks across the globe and the diversity that I see is amazing. Um, but I think, you know, to, to some of the points that was made on the, on the, on the panel, I, I think that, you know, COVID has been and terrible on so many aspects, but actually for news, I think it's been, you know, uh, forgive my poor phrasing, it's almost been like a, a very helpful crisis. Right? People talked about the, the, the things that have come from it. And I think that that core issue that I think it was Naya who said this, which is that, you know, people have seen the value of news, right? And no one's saying, you know, news is dead anymore or whatever was the, the, the phrasing there. And I think that that's something that we can all build on because from, from our perspective, we see this as a news ecosystem. Um, there's different parts to it, news publishers, suppliers, social media networks, search engines, they all have different roles in that ecosystem, but we're all interconnected. And so, you know, we at Google believe that we're trying to do as much as we can uh, to help that ecosystem overall from a sustainable point of view, from uh, a diverse point of view, and from a, uh, an innovative point of view as well. And just a quick question to both of you, very brief answer, if, if, if I may. Are you, your expectation over the next five years, are you going to be more active in, in supporting new, the news media industry or less? John? Well, I, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. It's, it's more, but I think it's a question to be, to be discussed about how. And we obviously don't want a situation where news media becomes reliant on Facebook funding either. So I think it's important to strengthen that independence uh, from platforms. Madhav? 
Yeah, definitely more. And I think the way that we've structured what we do um, under our Google News Initiative, our GNI program, is very much based around dialogue. And so we want to do more. And the kind of three areas that we operate in is, is product, tools and training, and innovation. And that's all been built on feedback from the industry. So that's why we built you know, products that help tools and training and, and the innovation work that we do. So if we can switch back to the panel now, thank, thank you both. Uh, re reaction to comments from John and Madhav, anybody? Well, I, I, I would say that I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the, uh, I think the legislation all over the world is helping publishers to have a bit more negotiating power with platforms. So I would say that uh, it is a good trend that uh, we will see uh, probably uh, more in, 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 in the future. But uh, I know it, it is a complete fantasy, but I would say if, to the question, what what platforms should do, I would say that it would be great if they could, uh, instead of um, just relying on advertising, to charge users, to charge all of us. So they would uh, maybe compete a little bit less with, uh, with the publishers on the one hand, and on the other hand, they, they, should, they couldn't, I mean, they could rely not only on clicks to prioritize content, because precisely because of this uh, uh, you know, the uh, centrality of click in their algorithms. Uh, we have all these clickbait type of content and polarizing content with really noisy headlines that uh, is probably part of what is happening. So I, I know it's a fantasy, but <laughs> that would be an idea. <laughs> so last question, because we are at, at time, and this is a sort of self-interested question as one of the uh, investors in the new European newspaper. Uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, it's clear that um, the pandemic has been a good crisis in many respects for the news media. Uh, trust up, new subscribers, as Rula was saying, um, in some cases, people subscribing now to more than one uh, product, which is really encouraging. So willingness to pay increasing. Your optimism, though, outside of the pandemic, let's think the next kind of three to five years, um, Give me your sense of optimism around the news media uh, uh, and, um, you know, what you think the conversation is going to be like when we're talking again in, in, in you, you know, over the next the next few years. Maybe I'll go uh, uh, to Rula first and then we'll, we'll, we'll go around clockwise on the screen. Rula, how optimistic are you? What I hope, well, what, what I would hope for is that um, by, by that time, uh, we stopped talking about the digital transformation because the digital transformation would be, uh, would be a done deal for most of us. I was quite struck recently in talking to several uh, European editors uh, that compared with, with the US, uh, at least, uh, you know, there is still a long, a long way uh, to go. Um, I hope that prints will still have a, uh, a role uh, to play because we have readers uh, who want it. And I would hope that our newsrooms are more diverse and are uh, can can appeal uh, to a more diverse audience as well. Oh, yeah. Level of optimism around the news media, the, uh, so that we can get push that number, that 53% who don't care how we can actually <laughs> increase the people who, give a damn about journalism and news. For, for me, it is there. I think what well, I think, first of all, I think it, we are looking at challenging years ahead. You know, a lot of uh, people have been locked up. You know, of course, they watch a lot of television. You know, the teenagers were not allowed to go out and meet with their friends. Right. That is kind of the perfect circumstances to kind of, you know, or, uh, publish their television in. But as soon as they now they are left uh, homes again in many places and that means they're not watching as many to, as much television, and and that will we will see that in our traffic. And the other thing is, I think we have to also be level-headed around. You know, people were fearing for their lives. Maybe they are still in some countries, and that is a damn good reason to look up what the the rules for regulation or, or vaccines are. So, what I think we will be we have to do all of us is that we have to be more curious than ever before about what the real needs of the customers or the audiences are. And I think the reason why we have struggled maybe in the past decades is I don't think we have taken it seriously enough. We've not uh, 
honestly, especially a lot of us legacy media, we have not been willing to kind of, you know, do the transformation that were needed, moving uh, the, the, the resources. Or, uh, one of the things we're doing at the BBC, and it's coming back to one of the slides Nick showed, where you can see how a, a, a trust in what we do at the BBC is, is not even across the UK. And one of our the things we do now is that we move a lot of our teams uh, away from London and and just really reinforce our local presence. And that is not only because we want to be uh, covering all of the UK as best as possible. It's also another way of increasing our diversity because we want different outlooks, different mindsets. We want to know what is important for people. And, and then I think another thing is there, and, and just when I listen to Matt how speaking, I think I think there are still digital tools when it comes to kind of learning from search and others that we have not applied to kind of the full, we're, we're not leveraging it at full yet. And, and by that, I mean kind of really knowing what people need and then make sure that we publish the right, accurate, impartial, solid, good journalism, but and give it to people when they need it. Uh, uh, rather than asking them to kind of, you know, schedule their lives uh, around our schedules and habits. I think that that's a really interesting point uh, that maybe we, we should talk about next year, the, 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 the essentially the diffusion of trust. Uh, and I, I remember this was always true when I was at the BBC, that once you moved outside the N25, trust started to dilute the further, further you went away from the, certainly the big metropolitan areas i think it's a really interesting um topic uh, two you know last points from alexandra uh, uh um and then rosalia so alexandra how optimistic are you about the future well i'm really optimistic and more optimistic than in recent years despite we have witnessed one of the biggest fall uh, of circulation in history but uh this uh, crisis was really, as you uh, have pointed it out, a, a good crisis, uh, crisis to some extent for, for a media company because uh, this crisis was really accelerating the trend to digital uh, subscriptions. And now uh, our challenge is to keep uh, this uh, um, new readers and uh, we really have uh, to concentrate on on the young audience. I think this is also important in terms of uh, talking about our democracy because if uh, they do not, uh, if the, the younger generation uh, is concentrated on, well, conspiracy theories, uh, well, then, well, it's it's a problem for our democracies. So I think this is really the biggest challenge for all of us, all of us. Rosalia, the last word is going to you. Well, I'm quite optimistic as well. I think this trend towards uh, reader revenues, uh, I mean, it's focus on the reader revenues as the main model uh, for media is, is going to continue. And I think that is good because uh, media uh, publishers can concentrate on on the quality of content to to uh, to kind of uh, try to convince uh, the readers to become uh, subscribers or members. So I think that is a quite positive uh, trend. And uh, and of course uh, the the main challenge is to to bring um, the young audiences in and all the diversity. As is, as I mentioned before, we. Uh, we did some work in this in this sense uh, with uh, topics like climate change or gender. We can see that uh, younger uh, audiences are coming, and with some uh, with the work with the channels, and and I, I see that also that the there is a um, much better complementarity between social networks and and uh, platforms and and publishers with the work we are doing together now, and um, I think. We, we could do more in the in in the future. I see that the people is also beginning to distinguish a bit between the type of news they get from one side and the news they get from the other side. So um, um, they are coming more to uh, to uh, classic media, I would say, or or to the news titles to find um, serious stuff. <laughs> Talk, I'm, I'm talking about health and society politics and all these issues, and I think that is a quite a positive trend as well, but it's, it's going to be a challenge anyway. 
So look, I, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much to the panel. My audition for GB News has obviously failed terribly because I've run nine minutes over. Uh, so there we are. They're not going to hire me. Uh, but uh, Rula, uh, Naya, uh, uh, Rosalia, Alexandra, thank you so much. Utterly brilliant conversation this morning. Super interesting. And one that, as you can tell, you know, we could talk about this topic uh, all day long. And I'm very, very grateful for your um, contributions. And um, like you, I feel quite optimistic, I think, about the um, news media. I think the, the trends are starting to point in the right direction. But we'll see, you know, we'll stick with the Reuters Institute and we'll see next year whether um, the, you know, the insights and the trends from this year actually follow through as we move forward. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you.